Hi, everyone. Whoa! We've been allowed to fade that out by, by kind permission of Ian. Um, because uh, that film is bloody awesome. I think you'll agree. Um, and we're just... We're, uh, at the planet! Oh, you're so good at that. That's amazing. Um, the, we, I, had a, I had a weird thing. Sorry, the reason I'm padding is that we don't know where Ian is at the moment. <laughs> so we're hoping he's going to be... Jake's here. Uh, we're just waiting for Ian, so please don't leave your seats because I think this is going to be really interesting. Also, a little uh, parish notice. Ian's here! Hey! <laughs> Right. So, little Paris notice. Uh, you may have noticed the film was stuttering a little bit in the more complicated scenes. Uh, the reason for that is we discovered is that between this HDMI connection and the projector, there's like 10 devices it goes through. And one of them wasn't happy. And the reason it wasn't happy was we were fortunate enough to get the Blu-ray master copy of this film. What you've just watched will not be released to the public until November on Blu-ray. The very first time in the UK, uh, Hackers has been available on Blu-ray. I know, awesome, right? And uh, if, if, I, I don't think Ian will mind me mentioning that Ian's actually going to um, go with uh, Mark Kermode uh, tomorrow, and he's going to do Mark Kermode's going to do a whole commentary on the film. Uh, that's going to be on the Blu-ray. And that's a f you are the first people to hear about that. Yep. So the problem we had is that the file we were given is the uncompressed version that is mastered for the Blu-ray. It was 136 gig. <laughs> and that's what you just watched. So it's not really surprising that a few devices on the way thought, oh, fuck this. <laughs> yeah, OK. Right, so what we're going to do now is uh, we're just going to reset the stage and Jake and Ian are going to join us on stage. You've been tweeting your questions. We've got those. They're awesome. Some great questions. And they're going to have a chat. They're going to tell some stories and also answer your questions. And uh, hopefully my, my beautiful assistant, uh, a.k.a. my wife Trish, is going to bring those up to us very, very shortly. Oh, she's right there. Hello. Awesome. Um, for a little extra treat, after we've done all this, there's going to be a second showing of Tent Man, which is the film that was made at EMF in the past 2016-2014. Uh, and uh, it was shown last night for the first time. And he said, that's the absolute finished final version. And now tonight we're going to show the really absolute finished final version. Uh, so there's a little extra treat coming on the way there. But what I'd like to do in the meantime, if we're all mic'd up, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the stage, Ian Softly. And also, Jake Davis. We should just put this here. Oh, no. <laughs> Ian's gone off with the whiskey. That looks very good. Oh, we should just put it facing out here. Yeah. The real star but is the whiskey. So, actually, because I'm a bit nosy, and I'm also a huge fan of the film, I'm actually going to bust in and ask the first question, if that's okay. Um, because I actually already really know the answer, but I think it's really interesting. Uh, which is, when you see the data towers and uh, the visualizations of the computers in the film, um, that's not CG, is it? No. I mean, CG at the time was pretty... Uh, in, in its infancy and look very, very two-dimensional. Um, but I think I would have done it the same way today because, uh, as you probably know, film is about 12K. Everybody's talking about, you know, digital video being 4K. Film's 12K. So Christopher Nolan, for example, does all of his visual effects for um, all his films, whether it's uh, Transcendent, uh, Interstellar, uh, he uses, he uses 65 mil film and shoots on, um, shoots on film. Uh, incidentally, the, the team that I put together for Hackers went on to form a company called Double Negative, and they are the team behind all of Christopher Nolan's films. And I didn't know this until I interviewed Christopher Nolan um, at a director's event in London uh, a couple of years ago. And the, the idea really was that the, a big influence village visually on, on Hackers for me 
uh, was, the, was 2001, Stanley Kubrick's 2001, which I still think is the most incredible three-dimensional portrayal of space. And I wanted, I wanted the move through the inner space of the minds of the hackers um, and this database that mirrored the streets of Manhattan to feel as physical for us and not sort of like a two-dimensional experience. Okay, I was, that was going to be my first question to you before we moved on to these uh, inspirations, 2001 for me as well. Yeah. I, so, um, I guess, first of all, now that we've just seen it, we all have our favorite moments. I just wondered a, a very simple question. What is, what is your favorite moment of the movie? Um, I, I do like the, um, the Grand Central Station sequence and the final hack with the uh, rotating phone booths and, and an amazing, amazing soundtrack by Guy Pratt um, and an un uncredited um, David Gilmour from Pink Floyd. Um, if anybody's familiar with David Gilmour's guitar style, you can... Okay, is that, is that better? <laughs> Did you hear any of those, that first question? You did? Okay, so, so I think my, I, I, there are many scenes that, I, that, that, that I'm fond of and others that maybe I kind of look away when, um, uh, when, I, when I watch the film again. Um, but I think that, that scene uh, kind of encapsulates to me what I was trying to do, which was almost to sort of have a, a technological hallucination is what the film was. I just made a film about kind of the early days of pop music in, in England, with the, the Beatles getting together in Hamburg and, and the influences on them there. And I, was, I, I had this sense that, partly because the people I was talking to who were working in, in, in technology when we were preparing the film, I had this sense that what was about to happen was a kind of as a, a counterculture that was the equivalent to, to the effect that, that, that when rock and roll became a kind of popular music. Um, and so I wanted it to be as exciting, as playful, um, as much of a kind of total way of life as as kind of falling in love with with rock and roll was for you know those those early early musicians. Amazing, like Beatles' Yellow Submarine. And, yeah. This first question from James Andrew Stockel, who is he sorted out all of the sound and microphones, and so thank you very thank much. You, thank you, really, really yeah, yeah. thank you to him. Yeah, thank you. Seriously. Uh, he says, I wondered if Ian could mention how he was picked to do his cameo in the film. My cameo in the Your film? Your cameo in the film. I don't think I am in the film. <laughs> Sorry? Penn oh, oh, how Penn Gillette. Oh, yes, yes. Penn yes. This says Ian. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Um, Penn Gillette and Ian. Penn Gillette. Um, well, he was a friend of the executive. And we, uh, he was also very, very interested in the internet. And when he heard about the script, he asked if he could be involved. And we thought, because he was a, you know, in a way, he was a sort of a, a role model of the older guys that, 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 that we would be doing our research with, who were kind of a little bit from the San Francisco Silicon Valley, or even pre-Silicon Valley. Um, maybe people that were interested in, in uh, in kind of psychedelic culture. And there was a real link that, you know, psychedelic culture of the 70s and the idea of freedom, the idea of not being regulated, which those guys had. Um, they, they then kind of, some of those same guys actually moved into the internet as being an equivalent world, which of course hasn't quite panned out as everybody would have wanted it. I've got a question from Game Popper. Uh, an appropriate gaming question. How did using Wipeout footage come about? How did I think? Footage from the game Wipeout. Um, it, it was, again, it was something that um, we had so many advisors uh, who, were, who, were, who were in games, and I, it was just, it was, it, I think it, was, it, it, it came into the film before it had been released. We got a, it was, it was almost like the first time that that had ever been, and they made a special version for us. Amazing. Sorry, could you repeat you the question? Yeah. Yeah. 
I think I think what you're talking about is the is the is the website was hacked. Is that right? Well, the website wasn't really anything to do with the film. It was it was the marketing department of um, United Artists, and it's not a secret that I didn't really like the way they were marketing the film. Uh, and uh, and the guys that were actually hacking the website were guys that were working with us on the film. So it was a kind of like a. <laughs> yeah, very good. Very nice. None of you guys are on social media, are you? No, 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 no. no, no. This is I've never, because I, I don't think I've ever said that before. Okay. Speaking of so hacking. Just amongst life. us, yeah? <laughs> Speaking of Hack the Planet, I like this question because it, it contains the words Hack the Planet in capital letters. It's from Chrissy Swordfish. Love the film and gave me this question, gave this question some very deep thought. It often keeps me awake at night. How does one hack the planet? <laughs> well, it's a kind of philosophical question, I think, uh, that everybody can um, experience on different levels of, of existence. Um, uh, but it's a great phrase, and I think that that's what... I think it encompasses the idea of making your own rules, not, not kind of having things handed down, not having, not having somebody else's world handed to you in a way that you don't accept. I mean, and, and that was one of the things that seemed to me equivalent between what was happening with the early days of, 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 of the popularization of the internet as a kind of um, popular culture, counterculture, really. Um, and that was the same that happened with music. It was, about, it was about we're creating our own world, which have got our rules, and we don't want to accept the rules that we're rejecting from the previous generations. Was the phrase hack the planet then very vital pre-movie or did it very much come about as uh, the virality afterwards? I th yeah, I think it did. I think it emerged. I think it, 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 it caught on afterwards. Um, uh, and it was just the way, I think it was the, the way that the cast also just embraced it. And, and it, it was quite soon after the film came out that you know, people would, like you did this evening would shout hack the planet at screenings. We have another question from Game Popper. Very nice. How much research went into hacker culture and hacker systems and systems in general for the film? Uh, well, we, the, the, well, it started with the writer, Raphael Moreau, um, who actually knew Emmanuel Goldstein, who, uh, this was a long time ago, so I, my memory is a little cloudy, um, but I think there was a, a, a magazine, 2000 AD, it wasn't 2000 AD, it was something... That's it, that's it, yeah. 2600 and, Hacker Quarterly. And Emmanuel Goldstein was, was one of the first people that Raphael Moreau spoke to. Um, and, and, and he's actually, I think, given the film his blessing. Um, when we, we did a mini re-release two years ago in America. It was, it was going to be just a single anniversary screening. And it just got picked up by a couple of uh, cinema chains. And, and it was shown in about 13 cities, in all the major cities in America. And a lot of press, particularly sort of um, uh, in the kind of science and tech and, and counter, you know, like Wired and Vice, covered, covered the film. And, and, and they actually interviewed Emmanuel Goldstein. Um, we also had a group of, um, uh, of, of hackers who were sort of always on site, always on, on set, rather. And actually, would sometimes change what we were what we were shooting. Uh, most notably, one of them said to me, uh, "I think we should change this because it's not totally authentic." And it was we were at the top of the Empire State Building, and we were somewhere where we shouldn't have been. Um, we went. We got one of the production team to talk to the person who was um, escorting us and ask them a question about, you know, could we get access somewhere else? And we went up to the top level, where I don't think anybody's ever filmed before. Um, and it was at that point that they said, you know, will you rewrite, can we just rewrite this? And, uh, and it was Angelina's w words, and, I, and I, uh, I said to her, look, I, I, you don't have to do this, because, you know, an actor obviously likes to learn their lines the day before. And she says, no, I'll do it. And so she was, we, I was handing her the, the page with the new... With the, with the new script lines on it, and she would just read a couple of lines, do that scene, and then and then carry on. So so we had people on on set all all the time, um, and I took Johnny Lee Miller, 
again, Raphael Moreau would have been, had been hanging out with a lot of the hacker groups in, in New York in the year before filming. So uh, we, we got the actors to attend as many of those conferences and get-togethers as we could. Oh, in that regard, um, I was going to ask, did any of the actors uh, embrace hacker culture afterwards? Well, they all, they all became, uh, you know, I mean, most of us didn't know anything about it when it, when it started. I mean, we, we'd, I don't think I even had a laptop when I, when I read the script. Um, and I think the actors were the same. And then everybody, we, we, all, we all had our, um, I think I had, I think Ian at crash.demon.co.uk was my first, my first um, tag. And, and we all, there was a thing called New York Online that we were all, uh, all signed up to. And so, so very, very early on, we would actually get online in the evenings and just, and I encouraged the actors to do that. And yet everybody carried on afterwards. Do you ever just tell Johnny Lee Miller to use Signal, use Tor? <laughs> to do what, sorry? <laughs> Do you give any, any, any hacker advice now to the, to the actors? I think that, I you know... I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't to Johnny. We need to get them here for I that. wouldn't to Johnny. No. Another, another very, very, very serious question from Matthews Garrett. Why, why rotating phone boxes? <laughs> it is, it, we love it. We love it. But why? <laughs> it was really the idea that it was a sort of a, a technological hallucination. I think I said that earlier. And that, and that it, they were, we were so inside their heads that, that this is a film on one level that's about outlaws <clears throat> who are the good guys being chased by the cops or the bad guys. I mean, that's you know, a classic sort of Robin Hood story. Um, but the, but the, the, the terrain of the chase, if you like, happens in an invisible digital world. So the big challenge of the film was how to present something that you can't see. And that's, you know, we started with the idea of, okay, these guys live in Manhattan. Let's create a world, that in an interior, an internal world, that looks like the physical world that they inhabit, but make it as real. As, so the world of their imagination is as real. And it was really just a way of making that whole thing go to another level in their minds that this was a level of concentration and a level of excitement that, that, was, that had to be a climax of the film. Um, and as I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pretty pleased with it. Do we know how much time we have left? Uh, a couple of minutes. One more question. Oh, 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 no, this is very tough now. Right, we need a good... Well. <laughs> that was obviously, obviously a question that take, needed a light, you know... I will take a couple of minutes couple to of minutes, the question, uh, and then to, we to not have yeah. any question. Would you like to pick a question to answer for your, your, your favorite? Well, have you got, have you got one? I, I, I want to know a little well, bit I, more. I, I, I'm I, a little bit more about, about, about whether there were other people that you were working with when you were doing your activities, internet activities, <laughs> imaginative, creative activities, uh, whether there were other people who were similarly inspired by the film or whether you were kind of acting on your own, or is this completely... Others so inspired say, by the film. Yeah. Oh yes, everyone. Yeah. Absolutely everyone. You just heard someone say, "Yep." Yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone is inspired by this film. And not just for the the criminal activity. No, don't worry about that. It's no, no. Very good <laughs> um, but yes, uh, there was another card there that said t t to me what what age did I watch it? Uh, Twelve, thirteen, something like that. Um, and honestly, on that point, d d d even now in in uh, two thousand and eighteen, I, I like youngsters, my my friends, my good friends, two daughters who are ten and twelve watched yeah. the film last year and they yeah. loved it. Um, do you still have people of, of that age, the age, you know, some, some of us when we watched it and younger come up to you and, and talk about its relevance or, or what's a Gibson? Or, you know. Well, I think, the, I think the, um, the thing that's strange about the film that, that I, 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 I don't quite know the answer to this one. And, I, and I, um, I hadn't seen the film until I'd watched it on a big screen at the Prince Charles screenings in London two years ago. I hadn't watched it for 10 years. And it, and it struck me that, for, first of all, that that there are many things that are quite conventional about the storytelling and that it's really about a group of friends who are adversarial and trying to get one up on each other at the beginning and then they then they 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 put aside their differences and the and the individual mm. um, suppresses their own um, 
well-being, if you like, you know, risks being caught in order to support the group and help their friends. And I think that's a very uplifting mm. message that the, that the film has. But I think in terms of the age groups, um, the, the, the story uh, takes place with, I guess, what we would call six formers. So people who are kind of, you know, 17, 18. And I think that they're, uh, it, it's a little bit of a hybrid in terms of its appeal, I think. Because I think that there is definitely an appeal for sort of people that are, you know, 15, 16 year olds love watching films about 18 year olds. And I think when the film came out, its real core audience was sort of, on one level, was 15 and 16 year olds. And I knew that because I knew a couple of 15 year olds that were saying there were no films in the cinema at that time for them. There was no Twilight, there was no Hunger Games, there was no, you know, the older Harry Potters. So if you were 15, 16, there wasn't anything. And I think a lot of those people who embraced the film at that age, are now 35 and are in tech or in media or, or, or online, you know, and they all come to me and said, that's the film that I watched when I was 15, 16 and realized it was cool to be into computers um, and that it was a, something that you could use, you could express yourself in many different ways through that world. Um, but I think that at the time that it came out as well, there was... Um, there were people who were older who were already in in, in, in in that world. And I think, as I said earlier, there was a kind of link between the, the kind of slight hippie psychedelic world who were, who were looking at breaking down frontiers, trying to live free of, 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 of kind of uh, what they would call straight laws at the time. Um, and I think those were the two audiences, really. Um, and uh, and there's and I think that there's a kind of it's like a cyber fairy tale as well. So I think that that you know that you you, you kind of have to go with the sense of fun of the film. And we never we never wanted it to be a film about technology. We wanted it to be a film about the culture that de technology had created. <laughs> Just, just told there's time for one quick one. You're going to hate me for this question, but so many people have been asking me today to ask you uh, another Hackers movie. Well, I mean, we, did, we do get asked. Um, and, you know, on one level, it will be fun. Um, I suppose the question is, would we get the cast together? Um, you know, would, 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 would they be... Uh, would they all be kind of security heads of, you know... Uh, um, American Express now, and or maybe one of them would be, and one of them would be, uh, would be kind of outlawed in uh, a tax haven somewhere. So yeah, I mean, this you know, hey, this is we can carry on and get get a story going here. Um, get the band back together. Get it? What? Sorry. Get the band back together. The band, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Will they reform? Will the band reform? Uh, and I, it, it was interesting because my first film, I don't know whether anybody s here saw my first film, Backbeat. Um, thank you. And that was really about a band. And I wanted to, and it was about a band in the past. And I wanted to say, well, what's, what would be the equivalent of a band in the future? So I don't know whether you noticed, but the, 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 the shoulder straps on the laptops were like guitar shoulder straps. And we made a lot of those kind of, those connections. But um, I don't know. Uh, I think if I think everybody, I think it would be fun if the cast wanted to come back together. As somebody just said, if the band reformed, I think the whole band would have to reform. Well, in this regard as well, like you mentioned, 2001: A Space Odyssey, a timeless movie. I saw that one again last year. Um, uh, Hackers, I think, will continue. I think it will be relevant in 2028, 20, 2038, in the same way as you mentioned 2001, and the similarities are there. So maybe no need. Maybe this one just says it all. Maybe it predicts some things that will occur. Maybe no need. Yeah, was, one of the things that I was most pleased with was somebody made a comment recently um, that it was uh, that, that you know some of the parallels today was that it was it's a very diverse cast, uh, and that's something that we really. So, James, what has occurred? <laughs> oh well, you can buy a new one. <laughs> Have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> sorry, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that was no, really though, have you? Yeah. That does genuinely work. Uh, 
trackers in the future? Um, yeah, there's, um, there's, a, there's a Blu-ray release later this year, and next week I'm recording a commentary with Mark Commode, and Mark has been an incredible supporter of this film when a lot of people weren't supporting it. Um, and so that's going to be really interesting for me. He, he, he was sort of behind the re-release in America in a way because we had a Blu-ray release in America and Mark did a little contribution to the um, bonus material saying that it really needed to have a cinema screening again. And as a result of that, we did do a number of screenings. So I think we will do some screenings. Prince Charles have said that they want to do some more. Um, fantastic cinema. Um, and then, we, uh, fingers crossed, but it looks as though we're going to re-release the CD and a vinyl. And there'll be like a gatefold with a lot of visual material, a lot of interviews. Um, and most excitingly, mu from a musical point of view, the CD will reflect the film in a more complete way than the previous uh, CD did. Um, because we're going to have the Guy Pratt... Uh, track with Dave Gilmore, the Grand Central uh, Station track, and also the the other uh, a couple of other tracks from the movie that we weren't able to put on the original CD. I mean, when we did the original CD, it was released after the film came out. Because when I did Backbeat, it was effectively a grunge soundtrack because we we had the actors miming um, to so the songs that Beatles would have played in Hamburg. And the band we put together for that was Dave Grohl on drums, at the time he was with Nirvana, and Mike Mills from R.E.M., Thurston Moore, um, uh, Mick Mills, I said Mick Mills from R.E.M., Thurston Moore um, from Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth. And so the record company were expecting a grunge soundtrack to Hackers. And they said, what, what's this techno shit? You know. um, and it was, it was about a year later that a lot of these bands appeared on the train spotting soundtrack. Um, but because of that, we didn't release the album. They would, we couldn't get a record deal. And, and, and when, the, when the CD came out, it came out made by this company called Edel, who was a small record company in England. And then they did Hackers 2 and Hackers 3. And Hackers 2 and Hackers 3, as CDs did so well, that there was a movie that came out in America and they called it Hackers 2. It wasn't called Hackers 2, it was called something else. Yeah, Takedown, was, it was the just, Kevin Mitnick story, right? Yeah. 2000. Mm. Yeah, and then they just put as a, sub, yes, they yes. Put as a subtitle Hackers 2. Yes, you yes. Know, it still comes up on IMDb if you put in Hackers, it comes up just below yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which they is, really piggybacked know. on you yeah. there. So this will be the first time that we've got a proper soundtrack, you know, first time released on vinyl. Um, really excited about that. All right, that's definitely about it. Very good. Mm. You, uh... I, I just want to say thanks so much for in, inviting us to this festival and thank you guys for giving mm. such a warm reception. It's, it's humbling, it really is humbling. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Jake, thanks so much for your interest and your support as well. And, um, it's been a pleasure meeting you too. Absolute pleasure to have you. It was a real honor for everyone here. Now, would you do the honors of choosing who gets this absurdly nice bottle of whiskey that I sort of don't want to give away, but... Do they have to let you taste it? Do they have uh, to give you the first taste? Go for whiskey leaks! Whiskey leaks, Millerways. Whiskey leaks. So, we can't see anything from here. Um, did, did anyone uh, have a costume? We, should, we, should people come up on stage? Yeah, yeah. if, if anybody is in a hacker's costume, can they come up? If here? you want to, uh, someone pointed out on Twitter very correctly, if you would like a non-alcoholic prize, we have a few uh, Raspberry Pi powered computers, Pi tops with a nice power rail, very nice. Yeah, if you want to, uh, just come on up. If, or, or if you don't want to, maybe over there or something. And you should pick. You should definitely pick. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> come on, come on down, come on, come on. Yes. <laughs> hey, man. Hey. Anybody else coming forward? If you you win if you're dressed as the Gibson. Very good.
É, yay! <risos> Yeah, there's got to be somebody else. No, is that it? I saw somebody looking like acid burn walking around, I'm sure. There are those. <laughs> oh my God, this is so difficult. I think this is, this is more difficult than directing a movie. <laughs> Do you think do you think the audience should decide? Yeah. Yes. yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah, whiskey links. Okay, so for the for the first contestant, I don't know whether you agree, Jake. I think the two women, it's, a, it's going to be a clap off. <laughs> Agreed. Okay, one more time for, what's her name? Hannah. Hannah. For Hannah. <laughs> and what's your name? One Meg. One Meg. Okay, it's very, very tight, but I think I agree with the audience's uh, conclusion, verdict. It's Hannah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you again, Ian. How are you? Ladies and gentlemen, can I just have one big, massive round of applause for Jake Davis and Ian Softly? Seriously, we are so honoured for them to have taken the time out of their busy hacking schedule to come and visit us and spend time with us this evening. It really is an honour. Uh, for the rest of you, I thank you so much for coming along and packing this entire place out. We're really honoured. I'm sure Ian's been delighted by you all, all coming along. Uh, we're about to show Tent Man in about five minutes, if you want to hang around for a little bit more. Um, and also, if you want to actually live in the whole hacker's um, worlds that you need to get over to Cybar in the null sector over there because it's just like walking straight in there. Final thing I'll say is tomorrow night we're showing hidden figures at eight o'clock and about 20 past 10, Caesar sings the blues. And if you haven't seen that, you haven't lived. Thank you so much for coming along again and you have a great night at EMF. Love you all. Night night. <laughs>